Welcome to the Avalon Institute Wired to Lead podcast with your hosts Cameron Gott and Perry Smith. The Avalon Institute is on a mission to understand how individuals, teams, and leaders connect with others and the strategies they deploy to achieve the highest levels of success. Before each show, our guests take the Avalon Institute's Cognitive Peak Profile, available on our website at www.avalonleadership.com, and we discuss their unique cognitive leadership strengths. Thanks again for joining us, and here are your hosts, Cameron Gott and Perry Smith. And this is one of the inaugural um, tapings and and uh, construction of the Wired to Lead podcast. Um, mm-hmm. and Wired to Lead podcast originates from the Avalon Institute. The Avalon Institute, an advisory, a business advisory, um, and we also have a, a, a large array of assessments. The assessment we're talking about today, uh, and again, joined by our special Avalon teammate, Christopher Lum, is around mm-hmm. cognitive preferences. It is the Cognitive Peak Profile Assessment. And the Cognitive Peak Profile Mm -hmm. Assessment is an assessment that shows us very clearly how our brains activate for certain types of information. It's a a great depth of work to jump into with Chris today. What we'll be talking about is how his brain activates, him having taken the assessment, the Cognitive Peak Profile Assessment, in a couple of different realms. The realms are the associative or fast processing or, and I'm sorry, and the sequential processing. It's how his brain activates instinctively for this type of information and what he, how he prefers to process information. So the reason that we love the assessment is that the assessment is, we feel is so much stronger, uh, Cam, and, and, and we've talked about this a lot. The assessment we feel gives so much more detail and actually actionable data, much more than the Myers-Briggs profiles. It, it identifies what we call the hardwired traits in the brain and the cognitive activities that the brain does efficiently. And then there's, it also identifies those that it doesn't do so efficiently. And we identify those as being blind spots. So when we work with people at Avalon, we work with business leaders, we work with members of the military, uh, elite athletes. What we also like to talk to them about is, is acknowledging where they may struggle Uh, in terms of certain kinds of information and processing and then give them the steps that that to say wait we can also help you illuminate those blind spots and i think that overall um and cam you'll you'll expand on this as well the best part of i think about learning uh your inborn cognitive preferences is that you can also make changes it's you can make changes to how you process information how you choose to process information how you communicate those to your teammates to a loved one to your kids and, and actually have real performance improvements. So having led in that way, let me, let's shift over to Cam a little bit. And Cam, again, is an Avalon teammate of ours. Uh, Cam has a very, very successful coaching practice. Uh, Cam, you, uh, is, I'll let you talk about this, but you, you handle global creatives. Can you talk a little bit about what a global creative is and a little bit about your practice? Sure. So I've been a coach for about 20 years now. Um, I started working with kids with ADD move to adults and now I work with uh, innovative and creative leaders who are uh, often on that spectrum. Uh, I like to include a a larger group, call them global creatives. So global creatives are global in vision and they are um, creative in action um, when they're clicking right. Sometimes they can take that creativity and use it as a distraction, right? To creatively get out of tight spots. And so they're not using their creativity uh, to, the, to how it can be used. I just got off the phone with a guy who just crushed a, uh, a meeting with a reoccurring um, customer, a $10 million client. And we were talking about how he was able to access his creativity because he was well prepared on the front end for that meeting. Um, you know, I, I, as I'm listening to you, Perry, I'm just thinking about um, what I like about the CPP is how it uh, really hits at this cognitive level. Um, I'm teaching a leadership coaching class right now with uh, Ellen Fay, who's a productivity specialist. 
And we, um, we just did week four around these assessments. We looked at a, a, a bunch of assessments out there, Myers-Briggs, DISC, um, Strength Finder, uh, EQ, uh, Emotional Intelligence, um, and a couple others. And um, you know, they're looking at, it's, they're all valuable, um, and they all have their um, sort of, they, they, they create their kind of area of focus and, and to focus in on. What I like about the CPP is it's really looking at these uh, cognitive, at this level that often people are not looking at, right? We're looking at uh, personality. We're looking at, um, you know, say uh, a psychological level. And this sort of um, looking at what the brain prefers to be doing and how it has this uh, habitual way of behaving in the world. Um, and it's what blows my mind is how many people are not aware of how their brains are at work all the time, right? Of the beliefs we generate, um, uh, of the behaviors that we do over and over again. I teach a, a new habit class, right? So habits are all about uh, creating effective change and having that change sustained, or excuse me, this new practice over a period of time. But for the brain, change is really hard. It's really tough because that's part of self-preservation. It's something called homeostasis. Mm -hmm. But when we have an understanding of those blind spots and those strengths, then we can start to steer them a little bit, right? To steer around those potholes and really aim for those, uh, you know, the, the, what I call the city of bright lights, right? Getting to those places where it's really where we do our best work. But, but we talk about that at Avalon a lot. And, and I think that the notion, if, if you, the term for that would be really metacognition, correct? Mm. thinking about our thinking and we're yeah. conscious of that and it's interesting in talking with uh, uh leaders and you know again athletes and team members that we've worked with uh it's amazing to that, that people have kind of uh proceeded in their careers and and proceeded along a path in either business um uh or their own personal growth and they don't take a step back to actually think about how they may think of things or, or how that translates into action. And so the concept of metacognition is something that we like to focus on a lot. I do want to, I do want to bring up a point. So again, I want to remind everybody. So we're joined by Chris Lum, Avalon teammate. We're breaking our, this, our, our, this dialogue down into an understanding and we'll use Chris as a great example. And he can explain this more of the difference between thinking uh, is, is an associative preferred thinker, i.e. a dot connector, which Cam, I believe uh, a, a, large, a large quantity of your clients are, are associative uh, process, uh, preferred thinkers. Am I correct in that? Yeah, that's right. They're either uh, balanced processors, uh, but the majority are uh, active associative, right? They really prefer that. Right. And and a, a reference material uh, around a fast thinking or associative thinking is also Daniel Kahneman's book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. And that is a high recommend um, for anyone listening to this. But getting back to Chris, because Chris, we need, to have, we need to have you jump in the conversation. Your brain prefers to think a bit more sequentially. Um, for anyone who's viewing this at this point, Chris, I'm sorry, you're on the line right now, but I'm going to go ahead and pull a graphic up of your scoring and it's going to show itself in a pie chart. Um, about how your brain uh, essentially breaks down on a scale of one to a hundred uh, in terms of a, mm -hmm. a sequential versus associative. So I'll pull that up um, and, mm -hmm. and maybe you can comment on, on what that means to you as far as thinking sequentially. Right. Um, so yeah, this, uh, this assessment was, uh, I never really had language, uh, or, you know, to assign and really talk about, you know, how I prefer to, uh, process information. So this tool has, has done exactly that for me. And uh, where I wound up was about 51% sequential and more on, on that side of things, more than uh, associative. And how what that means to me, and, and, and that very much resonates with me, uh, is because I prefer to have to-do lists. And I'm always looking at my calendar. And, <laughs> um, you know, things are very much deadline oriented and step-by-step -step oriented when I, when, I, when I do things and when I want to hit, you know, certain milestones and, and goals. So that's really how I prefer to work. Uh, I, I found that's how I'm most productive. 
um, you know, in my, in my full-time job, as well as anything else that I engage in, you know, the chores around the house, <laughs> I typically like to, uh, you know, schedule those into my, my calendar and, uh, make time for those or even scheduling, um, you know, you know, things I enjoy doing, you know, going to the gym or, you know, hanging out with friends. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's it definitely resonated with me, uh, my results of this assessment. And it was really, um, cool and beneficial for me to be able to actually assign language to, uh, you know, what I've been experiencing my, my entire life. Well, that's, a, that's, I think it's outstanding, Chris. One of the things that, uh, that we talk about in terms of this is, is again, the notion of, of active uh, versus balanced. Um, Cam, if, you, if we look at Chris's scoring, um, you know, how, how, how do you see this as far as, as, far as you know, where Chris lines up here in terms of him being more sequential preference? Um, and what does it mean, uh, you know, based on also your conversations with your other clients who are more associated preference, can, can you provide some context with that? Sure, right. The, um, and, and earlier before we started the recording, I appreciate how, again, uh, the CPP is this great vehicle for just being curious about how the brain works. And the fact that Chris has taken it twice and realized you know, that he scored even higher on the sequential the second time, right? Really appreciating uh, how the sequential is his uh, right, uh, modus operandi, right? That's his preferred mode of, of moving through life. So the sequential, you know, if someone is more active sequential, it's often uh, uh, really wired for uh, process, uh, seeing the, the, the end in mind, right? So uh, task-driven, um, uh, goal-oriented, and, and by the way, we should say that there's no preference here. That's the other thing I like about the CPP. It's not like we have to score 100 on any of these or that there's an ideal profile. Everyone is unique. And it's a matter of if you understand that uniqueness and you appreciate the assets that go with that and understand the, the blind spots, then uh, it's about leaning into that profile and making the most of it. So there is no ideal here. Um, but getting back to the sequential and the associative, uh, it's often the, the forest and the trees analogy, right? That my clients often are more about the big picture, the broad stroke. And so they see the forest, uh, by how things are related by context and that's their preferred wiring. So a lot of my guys will try to create a process and it'll break down. So they'll go back and start another system um, and, and it will, they'll do it for a week or two and then it breaks down. And one of the reasons is because they're not wired for process, which Chris is. So uh, the other interesting thing is that there's also uh, an appreciation for the sequentials, an appreciation of um, a hierarchy, right? Order, uh, some certain uh, useful structures, Right. So um, that authority is, is uh, right. They, they sort of seek and look for authority. And so Chris being successful as a quarterback on a, on a, on a football team, right. There's hierarchy there. There's authority with coaches and a certain, right. Uh, 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 an order to it, much like a, a, say a, a platoon, right. Where you've got your sergeants, you've got your Lieutenant and you've got your foot soldiers um, on the associative side. And you talked about Kahneman's book and the, the system one or the, the faster processor. Right. That's really that kind of, that's that thing that helps us in those moments when we have to make a split decision, right? Uh, in the old days, it was the, when the saber tooth tiger came around the corner and is that real quick response, right? To, oh, there it is. That's a, that is a threat. You know, so the brain, that sequential processor is not fast enough to really assess the situation. And so... Um, and so those are the, as you said, dot connectors, right? It's the bigger picture and they have an appreciation. A lot of uh, entrepreneurs will have this sort of the ability to have great vision, but then not be able to put that vision into practice. On the flip side, you can have uh, a sequential where uh, they're driven, but they maybe are, they lose sight of the bigger picture. So that's how that works out pretty much. 
Well, hey, Chris, I want you to jump in here because the, the, the notion, again, that Cam is kind of talking about is some, sometimes high associates are, are seen as being the creatives. Uh, again, doc, uh, as he mentioned, doc connectors, the ones who can, can fill in gaps. But there's, there's a difference, though. It, it's, it's also the difference between a, a, a sequential or sequentially active uh, a processor having process creativity. So while you might, while you might enjoy a process, a step-by-step -step, uh, systemization of a process, that doesn't make you any less creative. And, and I'm saying this because I know you. Uh, as a teammate, and, and I consider you one of the more creative members of our team. Can you talk to that a little bit, speak to that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, creativity is something that um, I definitely, you know, try to do and keep in mind, and, you know, in all of my work, and how did, can we uh, achieve creative solutions? I mean, you have to nowadays in any competitive business uh, environment. But um, what I find that I have to do is, you know, sometimes I do fall into, you know, the, the weekly hustle and trying to, you know, hit those milestones and, and produce reports and take action and follow up on phone calls and all these things. And you lose sight of, am I even working on the right thing? And are, and are we going about it the, the right way or the best way? Um, so I find myself having to kind of be very intentional with, hey, take a step back and let's at least for a moment here reevaluate what I'm working on and is this the best approach and are there other alternatives uh, to this approach and being creative. So uh, that's kind of the way that I uh, approach creativity um, and I think there's always a way to, um, you know, achieve the result that you're looking for. You know, you, <laughs> you got you to gotta think outside the box a little bit. So I, I, I do find myself, you know, kind of getting in the weeds sometimes and, you know, let's knock this out, check that off, check that off um, and move on to the next thing. But I, what I've learned to do is become, you know, take that step back and, um, you know, allow time to just, you know, get on a whiteboard and talk stuff out and, uh, you know, visually look at something and really comprehend what it is we're working on and consider um, you know, alternatives. And that's where I lean on, you know, teammates that have, you know, their own different profiles to complement mine and identify my, my, my blind spots. So, yeah. Nice. That was great. Yeah, that's hey, perfect. hey, Perry, you want to move into that, the, the fireside chat section here? Oh, well, we're, we're kind of getting to that point now. I, I did, uh, we have been recording this. Um, so, the, a lot of the basis of these interactions when we talk about cognitive preferences is really telling stories. Um, you know, Chris, t uh, thinking to things that, that you've, you've worked very hard on or crushed um, and, and had success or the things that you may not have crushed. Um, and so, so this, this type of format, again, just being a little bit loose and, and, uh, and make a reference to, to things that, um, that have, have worked or things that haven't worked, is, we seem to, to look at this as being very, very effective. Um, and Cam, you, uh, you you have hosted a number of these fireside chats for us, so um, you know guiding it through. If we have a starting point, um, Chris, I wanted to ask you because I want to also provide some context for the audience as well. Um, on top of being our Avalon teammate, uh, Chris was a outstanding quarterback at Lehigh University. And you know, uh, Cam hears me all the time talk about how I love working with athletes because they're very intrinsically motivated to get this work. Um, but Chris, a little bit of your background here, and you can correct me if I have my data wrong here. Uh, in 2011, uh, you were named the Patriot League Outstanding Offensive Player of the Year. You were first team all league quarterback for the second straight year. And you earned the Patriot League Offensive Player of the Week on five occasions, Sports Network National Player of the Week twice. And you were named one of the three finalists in the nation for the Walter Payton Award watch list, uh, given to the most outstanding player in the FCS. And for those who are interested in stats who might be a little bit more systems oriented, uh, Chris um, in 2011 was uh, 333 for 491 on the season with a 67.8% completion. Uh, wow. Passing for <laughs> pulling them all out. 4, Dang it. Yeah, he is pulling it all out, man. Where'd you get that from? <laughs> man. Have you forgotten these? And the final stat here, right. let me get to this 32 touchdowns versus only 15 interceptions. So. Mm. Right. Now, now having dumped yeah. all that all over you, let's talk mm -hmm. about what worked, what might not have worked. Mm -hmm. But you know, if we relate right. this again to 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 something that that meant a lot to you, okay. I mean, you know, you, it, being an elite mm -hmm. athlete, uh, 
there, there, are, there are things that work for, for you know, people who are performing at a high level and other things that don't work. Um, mm -hmm. What was your experience? Let's just ask you a very simple question if I can in this fireside chat. When we talk about illuminating and having giving you a little bit of an understanding through this assessment about your sequential preference processing, what are some of the things that it makes you think about in terms of your, your career as a football player um, you know, leading up to and then finishing your college career at Lehigh? Sure. Uh, well, I thank you for uh, uh, the, uh, the background and all of that. And um, yeah, so I had a great experience at Lehigh, um, you know, not only on the football field, but, you know, academically, socially. And when I think about this, um, you know, this assessment related to, um, you know, my athletic achievements, uh, you know, I, th I think they all kind of make sense. So, you know, even as a young kid, you know, I was always captain of all the teams. I played football, basketball, and baseball through high school and just happened to be the best at football. So that's what I got recruited to play in college and served as captain, um, you know, senior year. Um, and I think, you know, some of my characteristics in this profile served me really, really well uh, to be successful as a quarterback uh, and as a captain of the team. Uh, and, you know, the goal was to be, you know, a, a great representation of Lehigh Athletics as a student athlete in the community and, you know, represent the Patriot League and all of those things. So um, my goal going into my senior year was, I, you know, by junior year I was uh, an all-league uh, selection in the Patriot League. My goal was to become an All-American my senior year. Uh, so what does that look like and what is that going to take and what are the statistics that I'll, I'll have to uh, have to work? Uh, so the win loss column is all obviously the most important. And, you know, we we did pretty well in that uh, that respect as well. You know, we finished fifth in the country uh, losing to North Dakota State. But anyway, <laughs> um, so, yeah, what are the what are the milestones that are going to get me to become an All-American? Um, that was a, a clear vision that I had. Um and, you know, what are the steps that are going to have to, that I'm going to have to take? And it doesn't start, you know, you know, even in, in training camp, it starts as soon as that last game ends the, the, the year before. So um, the sequential side of me, I think, served me really well in game planning what I need to do um, in, the, in the coming months leading up to the season and, and, and on each week as far as a game plan for each week um, to, to hit the goals that I wanted to achieve. It, it it sounds like it um you know cam I, I i want you to jump in on this because if if as i'm listening uh to you chris uh the way that you you know, walk through your career the way that you motivated yourself and and essentially systematized your goals that seems to be a for what i'm hearing that was comfortable for you to do that correct i mean having that structure right. And, and how, right. did, how did you convey that to your teammates? Can you give some examples about how you were talking about how did your plan uh, work as far as communicating uh, to your other teammates? Right, and I think just to, you know, talk about first, um, you know, just about athletics and sports, you know, are very highly structured in themselves, <laughs> in itself. So, I mean, especially, you know, the college student athlete nowadays, my God, their whole day and week is completely programmed for them. You know, God forbid if they want to join a, a university club or organization, you know, there's no time. Oh, yeah. uh, so it's a very structured, it's a very structured environment in itself, which uh, I think played well into, you know, my, my, my characteristics and in terms of, um, you know, com communicating uh, the vision of the team um, and the team's goals to everyone else. You know, you just, you know, I did that through, you know, intentionally trying to build relationships and, mm -hmm. Um, you know, all those kind of leadership development type of skills, you know, that you need to, that you need to do to be successful as a team. So, um, <clears throat> obviously, I wasn't aware of this tool at the time when I was at Lehigh. Um, but, you know, I definitely did all of those things in, in terms of, you know, communicating uh, intentionally with my, my teammates and game planning each week and, you know, watching film and attending meetings and all these type of things to make sure that, you know, it produced the result we wanted on Saturdays. Um, so, yeah, I mean, even, you know, the branding of our, our T-shirts and our slogan and our theme for each year uh, was not just on a whim. It was it was thought out. And how, how is this going to impact us, huh. um, you know, every day and motivate us? That's awesome. Um, I want to comment. Uh, what I'd like to do is move into some specific examples. Right. You tell a couple stories. Um, but before we do that, I just want to 
I want to build on what uh, the discussion here a little bit, if that's okay. Uh, Perry, you said pr process rich creativity, which is really interesting. I think that um, I want to, I want to talk to the uh, listener out there for a moment. Um, and the listeners are hearing this new language. And it's like, you know, what is all this about? And I, I would invite you to kind of really sit back and listen uh, and be curious and, and watch yourself, right? Watch what your brain is preferring to do. Be curious about your own uh, processor. Are you more sequential? Are you more associative? Just be curious um, and really let the, this unfold for you. Um, because again, the, the brain is very quick to go to assumption, like, like give me what I need to know and let me get out of here, right? Or what's the golden nugget here that I can use for my day? Uh, this is going to be a slow build over a period of time, right? We're really engaging with leaders around their leadership style and then how their own self-knowledge of their traits, of their assets and their blind spots serves them to be better leaders and better influencers. Um, but what you just said there, Perry, I think that one assumption can be made is that, um, you know, the high associative can't be organized and the high sequential can't be creative. Right. And so I like what you said. We that, hear that, that a lot, but that's not, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> but that process rich create, yeah, the process rich creativity you were talking about is that Chris here being creative through process and Chris, you just did another in an area of, of vision, right? That your vision is process rich, right? To really, mm -hmm. to with mile markers and this, uh, you know, the, 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 the ultimate goal of being an all American, and then basically backfilling, right? Of, of like, okay, what are the steps? Right. Very systematic, uh, very process. Uh, but so that's the way that you access uh, vision and creativity. Um, mm -hmm. and, and a personal preference there. Um, so let's, uh, let's jump in uh, around specific stories here. And really there's two, there's two questions that we have for you. Uh, around this whole fireside process. And it's like, really think about um, a time when you absolutely just crushed it, where, and speak to it like at a granular level of what that was and how you crushed it. We're just gonna look at, you know, how your uh, CPP might come into play there. On the flip side, we're gonna mm -hmm. also ask you about a, uh, an incident where uh, maybe you weren't at your best. Um, mm -hmm. that you tripped and fell and there was, uh, again, use the F word failure, but, um, and how it may have, the CPP come, came into play there. And then the learning from that experience, right? Because great leaders learn right. from that and move right. forward. So let's start with the, right. the, the crush. You got a story for us? Right. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, so uh, for the list, listeners, I recently graduated uh, from Lehigh. I went back there. Uh, for a master's degree uh, in technical entrepreneurship. And uh, that was a great program. But on top of that, I had a couple other uh, things going on as well. I was working as a graduate assistant in the athletic department uh, and, you know, pursuing uh, kind of my own uh, quarterback training business on the side as well. But anyway, uh, so a lot of things going on. And I, where I think uh, helped me in terms of my profile is my ability to multitask uh, and, you know, create structure uh, and, and in a situation that seemed to be, you know, all over the place all the time. Um, so specifically for my graduate assistant position, uh, a big uh, undertaking that I led and took on was this whole uh, initiative around career development uh, targeted for our student athletes. Uh, a lot of times, you know, every university has a career services department, but a lot of the events or workshops and offerings that they have are just not, um, you know, not doable for student athletes with their time schedule. So anyway, I started this whole new initiative and we were putting on this event um, that, you know, trying to organize people and coordinate, you know, the space and food and all of this stuff and say, I don't know how this is going to happen. <laughs> you know, how am I going to be able to make this work? And the deadline is quickly approaching. And I find myself, all right, you know, delegating to other people to help make this event work. Uh, I find myself, you know, you know, generating process because otherwise, if you're just running around, um, you know, like a chicken with your head chopped off, it, it's going to be difficult. <laughs> so I, I find my times in times of 
um, stress. And, um, you know, when things seem to be kind of uncontrolled, uh, I find my time leaning on my preferences of structure, uh, leaning on other people to, you know, um, help out with, with certain things on the to-do list and putting it all together. Uh, and, and that, you know, put, you know, really helps give me a peace of mind that, you know, we're making progress and things are going to make it and things are going to uh, turn out just fine. So anyway, it was a successful event, you know, had guest speakers. Uh, it was this whole, uh, you know, women's leadership uh, type of conference that we did. So we, we, cool. we were able to pull in some great speakers, a great panel, and it was an awesome event. So that was a, a time where it seemed to be chaos, but was able to kind of reel it all back in, control it, create some structure around not only my work, but kind of my life <laughs> and, um, you know, do and, and still perform well and, and, you know, create some good results. Yeah. There was a uh, term you used there that got my attention. So sort of in this uh, stress moment that mm-hmm. you, uh, you went to this place of uh, generating process, you generate process. So you said that like, uh, it's a natural thing to happen. And I want to say that that is not a natural thing. It's certainly not a natural thing for me. Not for everybody. I do not, I do not, in a moment of stress, I do not generate process. You can ask my kids. Um, but when you generate process, how does that make the people around you better? Mm. Yeah, I think, I think, I mean, people naturally need structure, you know, they need predictability. So yeah. when there's a standing meeting, when there's uh um, you know, I just, just, you know, when there's a clear, you know, task list, when, you know, what's on the agenda, what is the goal, what are the dates? Uh, I think that gives people a little security on, you know, what is asked of me and what is my role and what are the expectations of me? So I think when you kind of lay those out a little bit and you take the time to do so, instead of just running from one thing to the next, to the next, and before you know it, you've committed to 20 different things and you don't know how it's going to get done, <laughs> which I think everyone does nowadays, you know, it, it's wild. But um, anyway, I think that that helps, you know, just the team, you know, adding structure like that helps the team stay on track. And I think it even, you know, structure um, implementing structure uh, can help, you know, really stress and, and, and anxiety uh, when, when leading up to, um, you know, if it's the big meeting with the customer or the event or whatever it is. Yeah. You know, so there are two things you said there that were key. Um, another one of the classes that was just teaching was around um, conflict resolution and, and uh, toxic individuals in work environments, right? You could, you can have a toxic individual generate process and it would just be like, a, uh, you know, one of these terrible places to work, right? Where someone's distributing mm-hmm. work. And here you said two things that are really key that, that tell me that it's, you're really um, a relational type individual, right? Of, of tapping into the strengths around you. Uh, taking the time, number one, right? Mm-hmm. That that taking time to really consider the process and what would be a good process and then getting input from others, right? Through the form right. of questions. So when you, when you show up with question, you know, and allow questioning to be in the room, then you're really tapping into this thing that I like, which is curiosity, right? Mm-hmm. That, that having curiosity in the space allows people to be vulnerable and share, and right, because they could also be like, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to, I got an idea, but I don't think I'm going to share because it doesn't feel safe, right? You make them mm-hmm. feel safe so they can take a risk and share that information. Mm-hmm. Would you agree? Right. Right. No, I, I completely agree. You know, that's incredibly important that, um, you know, you're not drowning out everyone else's voice, you know, by your, you know, generating structure. Uh, right. You know, it's not a dictatorship, you know, when should we have a weekly meeting? Right. It's not, you know, it's not Tuesdays at two because I right. said so. It's when works for everyone, what makes sense for the team, um, that type of thing. That's awesome. Uh, you know, again, you're, you're speaking like everyone does this, Chris, and I want to say that <laughs> they don't. But, uh, Perry, you want to say something? Yeah, that's, that's the notion of, of what Chris just described is what we call roundtable leadership, which is not a top-down leadership approach. Um, roundtable leadership uh, is inclusive. Uh, you bring in your teammates. Um, it is not a dictatorship, um, and 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 everyone uh, jumps into the process. 
One thing before we get to to the let's let's hear about a little bit of the struggle, Chris, because I know you have a time frame and uh, and we'll have to let you go here. Um, Cam, the, the thing that Chris has mentioned a lot is the notion of time. And in our work at Avalon, and especially with um, members of the military and administering the surveys, the thing that we find for associative preference thinkers is they conceptualize time very differently. Um, Chris makes it part of his system as a sequential preference thinker. High associatives, they have a little bit of a fuzzy uh, a notion of what time is. And time is maybe part of uh, the dots that they're connecting, um, but it doesn't necessarily um, make the cut all the time as far as uh, they, how they conceptualize time. They can get involved in something and the next thing you know, they've lost you know, two hours. Yeah, um, let me, uh, I wanna jump in. I got a quiet please. hand. So whenever I hear stuff around high associatives and time, I've got to modify a little bit when I hear, right? Because this is about finding good language. And uh, often people will say that people, high associatives or active associatives are time blind or fuzzy. So it looks like that. But what it is, is actually it's very dynamic interpretation of time, uh, right? That in one moment, time is wholesaled out, right? Um, when they have three weeks, they like they feel like time is in abundance and it goes very slowly, right? That metronome you've got it set way out there. That's, mm -hmm. but then you get to a deadline and then all of a sudden that concept of time, the rate changes. So it's a dynamic movement of what time means. For Chris, he has a real appreciation of time is this resource. I know how it passes. It passes consistently. One of the things I do, I know we, we do have to move on, but one of the things I do with my clients is to, to assign a consistent value to time because it's just something that passes, right? Give it a, a consistent value, like a buck 25, right? That's what it's worth per hour. Let it be that because they'll either be, you know, making it 900 bucks an hour or about uh, 33 cents per hour, right? Yeah, just like give it away. That. Well, that, yeah. that, that provides real value, that's, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, well Chris, go ahead, jump, jump on this here, and, and uh, we wanna hear a little bit more uh, from you, and especially around this notion about maybe some, some, in some situation it didn't quite work out. Uh, mm -hmm. can you, and, and, and we're, aware, we're aware that you have, you're looking at your watch, right? That's right. So uh, if you got a short little snippet of like a, just a, something where uh, ran into a sure. wall. Sure. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, and I'll never forget this moment because it, it stands out in my mind. Um, so it's something I've tried to be more mindful of. But, you know, when you're kind of, I feel like when you're more sequ sequential, again, you know, steps, process, what's the next to-do list, um, you know, have you completed that item that I assigned to you, am I on track, is everyone on track type of a thing, and I just remember going into this meeting, and, you know, I, I think every meeting room kind of has it, you know, you ask, you know, it's a 2 p.m. meeting, hey, what time was the 2 p.m. meeting, when people are walking in, and it's 2.07, I'm usually that guy <laughs> asking what time's the 2 o'clock meeting, uh, right. you know, kind of being a smart ass, <laughs> so anyway, uh, because, <laughs> um, but anyway, so the, 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 the issue here is that I think it can, um, it can negatively impact relationships uh, and getting people uh, to work for you, not necessarily because they have to, but because they want you and they, they want to and they believe in you and your vision. I think that's what, you know, leadership is to a T. So I think, um, so in this meeting, you know, I just started jumping in right into agenda line item number one. And I think it's very much worth, um, you know, whoever's leading the meeting, it's very much worth your time, at least here and there, to check in and get a pulse. And what's the temperature of the room and how are things going on outside of work? Um, and if that, that two to five to maybe even 10 minutes, um, doing that ever so often is so worth it uh, and, and building relationships with, with, your, with, your, with your friends and your teammates, because uh, that's what they are. Uh, so... Anyway, that day, I just, I just, after I like kind of looked back on that meeting and I was like, wow, like I don't, I, that meeting probably just came off. Like, I really don't care about these people. Uh, it's all about work. <laughs> work is all, work it's is all everything. about work. Uh, it's all about work. Um, and, 
you know, your home life is your home life. You know, when you walk into this office, don't bring that with you. And that's very much an analogy we use on the football field. You know, like when you step on in between those lines, whatever's going on with your grades, whatever's going on with your girlfriend, whatever's going on at home, leave it there because we're here to focus on football. And that has, I've, I've brought that to me to the meeting conference room or whatever it is, you know, and we're here to work and let's talk about what we're here to do. Uh, but, you know, there's the, the value of building relationships and, and trust uh, with teammates. You know, what, what's the value of that? You know, that they, they now stay an hour after work because they believe in you and what the, what the, what the product is and what the company is uh, because you care about them. You know, nice. so those are the type of things that um, I, I've realized can definitely be a blind spot, but it's something I've, you know, it's a skill, you know, that you can, that you can learn and be mindful of. Um, so anyway, that's my, Chris, that's my snippet. <laughs> Chris, let me give you an associative thought here as we wind out. What, what you just described uh, were a lot of the complaints around uh, Tom Coughlin when he, when he took over the Giants, uh, you know, and, and he was a Parcells guy. Um, and if, if you remember seeing anything about this, uh, you're a lot younger than I am. Uh, in the beginning, his players really struggled with the notion of, of, uh, of him and his meeting schedule. And in his mind, you were late if you were 15 minutes early to the meeting. And so mm, right. there were a lot of people pushed, you know, pretty hard back at that um, uh, until eventually he was able to, to obviously establish his track record of his success with the Giants and win Super Bowls. Um, but a lot of people didn't like that. Now, that is a very, very different notion, uh, uh, you know, again, of, of how things are today, uh, a little bit different from what we talk about around roundtable leadership. Um, he lost guys because they didn't want to work in that system. They, they thought he was too harsh. Uh, he didn't listen mm -hmm. to players. Um, eventually he was able to, and I think also I would say that he mellowed with age uh, and he eased up on his players a bit, but, uh, but there was a certain rigidity to that structure that worked for him a lot. And sometimes it didn't work. And, and a lot of players may not have even gone to the Giants because they knew that was the system uh, that he had put in place and it might not have worked for them. Um, mm -hmm. I, I love what you just said there because, like I said, we hit both sides of the coin, um, Chris, and we are going to be talking about cognitive processing on this, um, on this webcast um, quite a bit. Uh, the thing I want to remind people of, though, too, you are an Avalon teammate of ours. Uh, and for anyone listening, Chris has been working uh, on very diligently with another teammate of ours, uh, Aaron Mattias, also a, um, a, a working in the leadership development office at Lehigh, on a program around millennial leadership. And, and Chris, can you, before you sign off, will you give a minute or two on just what you've been working on with this millennial leadership program and how it might benefit uh, organizations or individuals? Right. Yeah, sure. Uh, so a quick uh, overview of what it is we're working on. Uh, and, you know, some of the facts are, you know, the workforce is going to be dominated by millennials in the next few years. Uh, so are you leveraging uh, their unique skill set, uh, you know, their unique experiences to uh, keep your company's competitive edge? Or are you being resistant to it and not branding your company the right way, not recruiting the right way, and you're suffering from uh, consistent turnover? Uh, so the whole goal of um, our workshop is to, uh, it's, it's the acronym REPS. So R-E-P-S, we're trying to impact uh, your outcome goals of retention, engagement, productivity, and then how do you sustain uh, that effort? So reps is kind of our model. And we break that down into, all right, so what is the process? You know, talking about sequential. So, uh, you know, <laughs> it makes sense in our workshop, right? So right. we broke it down into a real step-by-step -step process. On Those are outcome goals. So what does it take to... Um, you know, get better retention. You know, it's more about culture. You know, what does it take to uh, improve your engagement numbers? That's more about building relationships. So we really break it down for you. And we close the workshop with, uh, we did a lot of, you know, scraping the internet to find out what are the best companies doing, uh, like tangible best practices. And we've done a lot of homework on that. And we have those provided. Uh, so depending on whatever the industry is, we customize uh, what is working and what's not working and what's old school and what's new school and what is attracting millennials to Google right now. You know, what's attracting millennials to startups right now? Um, you know, it, it's different than what it used to be. So I'm based out of Detroit and I'm very involved in the, the startup ecosystem here. 
and, you know, co-working spaces, why are those taking off right now? Mm, you know, right. why, you know, why does every major city have an incubator and co-working space and here pops up another accelerator because they work, you know, and it's drawing people in, uh, especially the younger generations, um, you know, renting an office at an office building uh, is just not very attractive to people. So uh, at least the young, younger people. So anyway, that's, I rambled on there a little bit, but that's uh, the workshop and more than willing to uh, talk through it more with, uh, uh, you know, whomever may be interested. Well, thanks for that. We, we have to get you back on. And, and for anyone who wants more information on what Chris is up to, uh, take a look at www.avalonleadership.com uh, before he signs off. And uh, you'll, see, you'll see his bio there on, uh, on the website. And we're looking forward to hearing a little bit more about what's going on in Detroit because that has been, a, you're right, that has been a huge success story in attracting a lot of millennials. Um, and the other mm -hmm. notion, I have to give this as my blatant plug, uh, anything to do with um, uh, any workshops that we do give, we, we, we highly recommend taking the, the CPP, the Cognitive Peak Profile uh, Survey, so people can get, can get more of a feel for who they are and, and also from the organization side. So Chris, I know you got to run. Thanks. You said a lot. Uh, really appreciate your time today. We're going to get you back on the broadcast here pretty soon. Yeah. Of thanks, course. Chris. Thank you guys. Awesome. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Take care. How so about that? Have, yeah. The other thing that we talk about too, and, and we'll continue this a little bit because this is a, uh, a blocking and tackling broadcast, one of our initial broadcasts. So we get to uh, cover different uh, areas and different ground. Tell me what has your attention. Uh, about what we talked to Chris about. Is there something that's jumping out at you about that conversation? Because the nice thing that, that, that is interesting when we have these conversations with leaders, and, and even though we had said before that Chris is our teammate, uh, every conversation can be different. Um, you find out new things all the time. I learned a couple new things about Chris that, that I had never heard before uh, in terms of, of what he saw as his strengths and what he saw as his blind spots. Uh, but tell me, tell me what jumped out for you. You know, what jumped out for me is, um, you know, this is going to date the two of us, but, you know, Chris is a lot younger than, Chris is a lot younger than the two of us, you know, and he speaks with a wisdom, I'm just going to say it, you know, beyond his years. Uh, but that wisdom, really, if you look at it, is this, um, we fold in the, the EQ, right, that we, assessment that we offer too. Mm -hmm. This this sense this uh, awareness of self and comfort with self, right? Um, and then awareness of his uh, periphery, right? His environment, uh, and just comfort in engaging the way he engages. Um, yeah, the the fact that he can put words uh, and and you, know, you listen back to this, just to his choice of language. Uh, it's precise like a running route, right? right. Or like a, like a, a passing route there. Um, there's a precision to it that he is very comfortable with. So um, it just was fun to listen to and, uh, and, and get to hear more about uh, you know, one of our teammates. So, Well, at the same time, I completely agree with what you're saying, Bruce. this notion of self-awareness, especially – um, when we when we work with business leaders again or members of the military on a, a bit of this rewiring uh, that's happening with millennials, the, the interesting thing I hear from Chris all the time is is also the notion of accountability. Um, you know, due to his, uh, you, you mentioned emotional intelligence. Uh, again, part of the wiring that's all part of his system um, around performance and around success, and at the same time. He, he showed, uh, again, as in this discussion, that he's very intrinsically motivated. Uh, Chris is not the type of person who will sit and wait to be told. He'll either find a way or make a way. That's a kind of a trite saying, but he'll find a way or make a way. And that's, that's something that we've always known about him as a, as a teammate of ours. The, he mentioned Aaron. Um, Aaron Mattias, again, a teammate of ours who we'll have on, on this broadcast. Yeah, definitely. Chris, and we need to get into a little bit of definition about this, um, Cam, because I think Aaron would be a great guest for us to have because Aaron is what we call a balanced processor. Now, Chris, again, let's think this through. We have associative processing, 
and sequential preference processing. A balanced processor is a bit more complex. Now, Aaron is a balanced processor. I am a balanced processor. And Cam, you explained that you are an associative active processor, meaning that you're more of a dot connector. Right. Well, balanced processing is a whole different can of worms and, and a very, very interesting can of worms to delve into. So we look forward to having Erin uh, on the show to really break down what it means to her to be a balanced processor. In a nutshell, I can tell you, anyone listening, for me, I don't feel comfortable uh, if I don't have a balance between the how, i.e. the systems, and the why. If I don't have that balance, that becomes uh, uh, like, it's like a seesaw that is just either going up one way and down one way or vice versa. And I like to have balance. It's, it's sometimes it is a, 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 I would say a, a mode of thinking that works perfectly and other times you don't quite get the balance. But there's also a certain motivation behind trying to find the balance. And so we'll be talking about that a little bit more in the next broadcast. Yeah, the, um, what's so impressive with Chris as a active sequential, right? He's, uh, so sequential is having that, the how, right? That the, the river rocks are placed in front of them and they have a sense of how to get across the river. Um, the bigger picture of the why, what's compelling, you know, for that 61, it's, they're very, he has that why uh, locked in really well. It's really interesting for my clients I have a, a subset of guys who will come in the door. I call them why guys, right? Yeah, that they get right. so focused on the why that they get stuck in this kind of um, false awareness place of, you know, they got to figure out the why before they can venture into the how and make things happen. That's context. Context yeah. is incredibly important. What's the context? Who's involved in it? What's the core idea, right? If they don't have the core idea to anchor themselves then a lot of times high associatives kind of just are, 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 you know, blowing in the breeze, correct? Right. But they also often will think that they've got to think their way through it. Whereas experience, you know, having their experience and engaging, going out and, and uh, having that life experience, getting that hard fought learning. So then they can, uh, they'll get it there as opposed to researching or thinking about it. Um, Cause you talk about, you know, Chris, uh, ambivalence is a very foreign concept to Chris, who is a millennial, right? And yet, right. this is one of the big complaints about millennials is ambivalence, mm -hmm. right? But that's really from the outside. Um, uh, anyway, I love the work that he's doing, and I love how Avalon is really breaking down these barriers um, mm -hmm. around these different groups. Well, if we can provide a little bit of understanding, we hope that anyone listening today had uh, had a little bit more of a notion of um, of this this idea of cognitive preferences, and again, uh, different areas of information streams and how that that is how we individually each translate that into unique actions. We also will be covering in future broadcasts um, other networks, um, uh, regions of the brain, or regions of the brain, and how they activate. Uh, for different types of information, what we call immortal domains. And these are in the areas of your mover preference, your observer preference, your reader preference, your talker, and your listener. And we all activate very, very differently. And uh, it's very interesting to see some of the data that we've been able to assemble um, around uh, different uh, teams or groups or, or individuals um, and have been able to really plug uh, this data into to working on uh, different actions and strategies to, to actually, you know, to, to do what we all want to do, uh, hopefully, which is to get better. Um, but I want to thank you, Cam. Uh, this, again, for, for everybody, we appreciate it. This has been a, an inaugural broadcast. This is a blocking and tackling broadcast. Um, we hope that you got some good stuff out of it. For more information, please go to www.avalonleadership.com. Uh, we have our contact information up. Um, you can look on LinkedIn for Cam um, or myself. Uh, my name is Perry Job Smith, and we have Cameron Gott. Cameron, what uh, can you give people um, a little bit more information also about your website uh, for your friends? Yeah, so uh, the, the uh, CameronGott.com, um, and I've got That's a blog things, right? a blog there. It's called the Global Creative Blog, so they can uh, find me there. And uh, this has been a, this has been. A lot of fun, Perry, so I appreciate it. I've enjoyed it too. Well, thank yeah. you very much, everybody. We hope you'll tune in next time. We will have uh, more broadcasts up 
Uh, we're originally going to be seeding this on SoundCloud and we'll be moving into some other platforms as well. Thanks again and have a great day. Many thanks to our guest today. And if you enjoyed this podcast and want to know more about how you are wired to lead, go to www.avalonleadership.com where our roundtable is always open. Once again, the assessment is called the Cognitive Peak Profile, and it might actually change your life. For more info on the Avalon Institute and our advisory services and other products, send an email to info at avalonleadership.com. Special thanks to our producer, Brendan Kaunaki of Washington, D.C.-based Kaunaki Media. Please visit his website at www.kaunakimedia.com. Thanks for joining us, and please tune in to our next broadcast, always available on SoundCloud.